listeners. Welcome back to the Flipping the Bird podcast. I'm your host, Luke Lawhorn, the current sports editor at UTSA student newspaper, The Paisano. I'm really happy to be back here this week as I'm the only member of The Paisano who correctly predicted UTSA to lose against Army last weekend. Uh, I'm joined here by my colleagues, got Aramis, Rylan, Nick, and Connor here with me. I'm happy to be in their presence here, what they have to think about the game, especially since all of them picked Army to beat UTSA. So, Connor, I'll start with you. How are you feeling today, my man? Why you got to bring that up, man? Come on now. Um, yeah, no, you know, obviously a little disappointed from the game, but uh, I'm glad to be back, glad to be here talking some some footy with y'all. So, yeah. Yeah, I am very disappointed in our predictions because I can't stand Luke's victory lap that he will parade over us this entire podcast. So, for the listeners out there, be ready for that. And I'm upset because what I saw on the field on Friday and like what it like means for the season going forward, and man, it's uh, it's not looking too good. But we'll get into that. So, I mean. yeah, I was at the game with Nick, and it just it wasn't a good game. I mean, the the defense didn't look good, offense looked mediocre, and we got a few like good stretches in the second half, but overall, it just disappointing game. So Nick, Aaron, y'all went to the game together. Okay, yep. that's good. Uh, that's good. Good to hear. Uh, so yeah, let's get back to this game. Army did defeat UTSA thirty-seven to twenty-nine last Friday, as predicted. This game was, you know, pretty easily uh, pre- predictable for me. I, I figured UTSA would lose coming in. It's, the cherry on top was Frank Harris being on the sideline with a boot on his foot. Um, but I'm more interested to hear what Ryland has to say since he was at the game covering it. Wrote a fantastic article. He was very optimistic about us beating Army, even though I gave him some pretty great stats to kind of show why the Knights would win. But, of course, Rylan, I'll start with you. What were your takeaways from Friday's game? Um, I mean, truthfully, it was just a complete flip on what we would seen throughout the season so far. You know, the offense actually, you know, was doing things. And the defense, they just couldn't – they couldn't get off the field, truthfully. I mean, anytime it was uh, fourth and short for Army – you know, you know, you knew they were going for it. And for the most part, I think, I mean, almost every fourth down, you know, they got it too. Uh, so just seeing that the D-line was getting out physical by Army's O-line, um, the Army QB daily was keeping it for, you know, doing whatever he wanted. It was just uncharacteristic from what we've seen throughout the, throughout the year so far from the TSA defense. And um, if you had told me that Eddie Lee Marbury put up the performance that he did on Friday, uh, before the game, I would have told you that we've blown them out because with the mix of a good and efficient offense and a stout defense, which is what we had seen all year, um, I mean, there would have been no reason to expect that we lose, but obviously that's not what happens. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you totally. Um, the role is completely reversed. Like offense, honestly, despite the first drive, obviously where Kabori and Barnes had the fumble, they were pretty, pretty steady um, throughout the game. Eddie Lee Marburger, I think, was – a standout early, 17-25, 239 passing yards, three passing touchdowns. Pretty good for his, his first career start. Um, Joshua Cephas also had eight catches for 84 yards on a TD. So the offense, I thought, looked relatively well, like reasonably well. Um, it's just a defense, man. I don't know what was going on. They just could not stop that Army offense, especially on the run game. I mean, they were just getting dominated, especially in the trenches. Um and we had a pretty big injury in that game with Trey Moore. So it remains to be seen what's going to happen with that. I remember, you know, the past couple of podcasts, I was, you know, past two games, I was saying how good our defense has been. And I thought that was going to, you know, that's going to be the theme of this year was how, of, you know, our good defensive play. But if they play like this for the, like, play how they played against Army, I don't know. It's going to look rough. Um, the offense under Marburger, it's not bad. They, you know, they, they, can't, they, this game was winnable, even at the end, it was still winnable and it was because of our offense. But when you have the, your defense out there for like 40 minutes, you can't win like that. You can't win. And especially give a credit to Bryson Daly, uh, Army's quarterback. He put a clinic on us. So Bless our troops. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to like piggyback off of what these guys said, the defense, it just, it looked dreadful. I got a couple stats pulled up here. The time possession for Army was 44 minutes and 25 seconds. 
time of possession for UTSA was 15 minutes and 35 seconds. Like the UTSA defense just couldn't get off the field. And to piggyback also off of what Ryland said, Army was six for six on fourth down. Like, and they only punted two times. So that's, you're not going to win the game playing defense like that. I mean, UTSA knew what they were doing. They were running the triple option. They were running for most of the game, had 65 total carries, and they just couldn't stop it. So, I mean, even with the offense, I don't think they like played that good of a game. It was, it was pretty mediocre. I mean, they were only going – I mean, Mark Berger was only going to Cephas, and also when they had Barnes on the field, the, the offense just – it didn't look that good. But um, it was just – a disappointing performance overall. Yeah, you guys all bring up valuable points. And I really could sit here and go on about how I was right because this game was laughably predictable. But I won't do that because I just generally – I foresaw this. I mean, Coach Taylor said after the game, they Army really played like a perfect game from an execution standpoint. I mean, no turnovers, no penalties. That's Army football. Like that is a military <laughs> academy. No, no penalties. They they had the ball for 44 minutes, like three quarters of the game. They they had a possession of the ball. They had over double rushing yards. They did exactly one, what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And I don't think that's necessarily a fault on UTSA, um, especially with Frank Harris being out, even though, yeah, Eddie Lee Marburger played a hell of a game. Great game from him. And losing our best defender obviously hurt us and probably will hurt us this Saturday. We'll talk about that more in a bit. But Aramis, going back to you, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just think this loss was totally predictable for UTSA. Uh, there is one thing that I wanted to point out. Um, we cut the lead to 23-21, allowing a two-play 80-yard touchdown drive. It's unacceptable. I get it. You know, you think they're going to rush, and then they throw out the trick play. And I think it went for like 45 yards. But it's like unacceptable. You can't let that happen. And – it's just bad. I mean, I can't even – I was there. I saw it all. It was just – every time I would get my, my hopes up, Army would answer back, and it just didn't look good. Yeah, it was, it's, it's one of those things with this team so far this season. It's just been like there's so much hope. There's so much, you know, hype around the team. And then to have a performance like that, it's just – it raises a lot of questions. And I, I – it's so unlike that defense that we've seen in the first two weeks to play like that then against Army. Like, it was completely the opposite of what happened against Houston and Texas State. So it's a lot of question marks around this team. I think there's way more question marks than there were last year at this point. So, and now heading into this game against Tennessee, probably the best team other than Tulane that we're playing all season. So I'm just, I'm hoping we can get out of there healthy, but. I don't know. It's going to be tough. Well, one thing that I want to say is, look, I'm not one to complain about the refs for any game because I feel like even though, you know, you may have some bad refereeing at times, you still have plenty of opportunities to win that game. But, my goodness, the referees were awful on Friday. There was – one play I want to point out specifically was it's fourth down and uh, Marburger tar targets uh, Oscar Cardenas across the middle and there's a flag thrown. The whole Alamo Dome thinks it's defensive pass interference. So when the referee says offensive pass interference, I mean, you could you could just – the collective gas let out by the entire stadium. I mean, it had me completely shocked. Cardenas is jumping up for the ball, and the defender is right on him. Can you tell me where the forcible separation is enough to call a, a offensive pass interference on that play and kill the drive for ETSA? Because that's points on that drive for ETSA. And in a game where you lose in a one-score possession game, you can't have those penalties. And there, there's just plenty of instances of non-called defensive pass interferences that killed drives for UTSA on Friday that, yes, we could have played better. Yes, we should have stopped Army on, on fourth down, and we didn't. And, yes, they shouldn't have had the ball for 44 minutes. But, man, those are points on that drives. And in a close game like that, it, it's tough to swallow. You know, Ryan, I have to agree with you. You Brought up a good point with the referee. It was it was just messy, just messy. Um, and especially it was drive killers. The penalties were drive killers. We were so close, you know, in, into hell even field goal range. And when we got those penalties, it was over for us. Had to punt it. Um, I don't know. We will see how the UT, this UTSA team rebounds. You know, this Saturday in Knoxville in Tennessee. Um, 
you know, being Mr. Negativity here. I don't know. I'm doubtful because, you know, we lost to Army and, you know, Houston this year. So, you know, we're already looking at three losses going on the season. I don't know. I'm starting to believe a four-loss season is possible, even five. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, again, was pretty early on the nine and three, eight and four train. I will pat myself on the back for that. But, you know, I talked to Coach Trailer today, and he said something pretty interesting. Uh, talked about the refs. He he was not he was not there for it when I said when I was trying to give him an out with the refereeing. He said you got to play better than the refs. And then I asked him another question. Said the exact same quote again. You have to play better than the refs. So I don't want to give him that. And it's really hard when you only have 15 minutes of possession because, like, every little thing, like, every little call affects because you only had, like, I don't know, five possessions and each of them took two minutes. So, anyway, go, oh, going ahead to this Saturday, yes, definitely our toughest opponent, at least talent-wise. And if anyone does remember, I did predict us to beat Tennessee. However, I did not anticipate Tennessee to lose the week prior to college uh, – to Florida, and if anyone knows college football, you know when a good team or at least a more talented team loses the week before, they're going to be pissed off that next week, and it's really going to be hard to beat them, which does make me a little shaky on my um, prediction for this Saturday. But, Ryland, I want to go back to you. Um, Frank Harris is still questionable, and so is Trey Moore. Mm -hmm. So going to Neyland Stadium this Saturday, what do you give UTSA's chances without, you know, their best offensive and defensive player? Uh, None. Truthfully, uh, there's, I see no uh, way that we can win this game. I mean, truthfully, like, and if you listen to the press conferences and you listen to the comments from Coach Trailer after the game and, you know, it just kind of sounds like, especially when talking about the injuries to Frank Harris and to Trey Moore, it just kind of sounds like they're, they're just kind of packing it in for this next game, you know? they Maybe they want to just take the L this week. I mean, they don't want to, but, like, as far as, like, risking injury with certain players, they're not going to let them play, and they're going to try. They're going to take that bye week, and they're going to try to come out as healthy as they can against Simple. So, I mean, I just I don't see without our two best players, and you're already coming off a bad performance from the defense. It's just because before Army, like we had seen nothing that would indicate that the defense, like maybe hey, our defense is good enough to hang in there with Tennessee. But now we've seen it. You know, now we've seen multiple bad performances from offense, and now we've seen a really bad performance from the defense. And against you know a top twenty five, they were. Uh, top 11, you know, before uh, Saturday, I just don't see any way they can win this game at all. Um, for me, I think, like, the biggest thing is we need Frank Harris because of his dual threat ability. Um, the offense was, like, very, uh, like, predictable with Marburger. Didn't have, like, much creativity. And with Frank Harris, he had, like, 600 rushing yards last year. We're going to need that in this, in this game against a uh, volunteers defense that, over the last three games, they've allowed 139 rushing yards per game. And without that, and I think like Marburger, he has like more arm ta talent than Harris, but Harris is more dynamic. He can read and diagnose coverages better. So if he's not playing, I just, <laughs> I don't see any way that we win, especially because we're, we're in Tennessee with that crowd. And like you said, Luke, after a loss against Florida last, uh, last week, I just... <laughs> I don't see how we win on uh, on Saturday. You know, there's one positive to this though. We getting paid. All right, we we getting paid by the University of Tennessee Athletics. Okay? So good for our program. Um well, going into the, you know, real football side of things. I don't know. It's bad. It ain't looking good, I'll be honest with y'all. It's like I, would, I like to bring up, you know, college football is full of like Cinderella stories or like, you know, the the little school playing this big life and in, in athletics like, you know, the University of Tennessee. And I just don't see it. And I like to be hopeful. I don't think we can put, you know, I don't think we can lead at halftime like we did to the University of Texas two years ago. I don't think we can do that. Um, Again. They lost to Florida last week. They're mad. They, they didn't want to lose to Florida. They lost the ranking. They, they dropped in the rankings. So, and how could they lose to a team like UTSA? They can't. That would just look hor Like, their hopes of getting a good bowl game if they lose to us, which is fl flounder. They would wear the world. So, I don't think we can win. But, you know, crazier things have happened in the world of college football.
Yeah, I mean, college football is so unpredictable. So, honestly, anything can happen. But my personal feeling on this game is that I wouldn't even play Frank. I wouldn't even play him. I wouldn't risk, you know, with turf toe, it's such a difficult injury to manage. I wouldn't even risk it. I would rather take this third loss in non-conference and have a better shot of either going to the conference championship or winning the whole thing, the whole conference, than potentially getting him injured. Say, okay, say we win this game, but he gets injured, he's out for the season, right? I know it's, it's, it's a tough situation. I know he wants to play, but realistically speaking, I don't think it's a big enough – I think it's a, too big of a gamble in order to, to risk him for a game that even if he does play, we might not win, right? Now, I will say I've read some reports that Tennessee, their freshman quarterbacks have been getting the majority of the snaps in practice. Nicola Maleva. So I don't know if Milton's not starting. I don't know what the situation is with that. But Lamaleva has been getting the majority of snaps. So that could maybe give hope for UTSA with the inexperienced quarterback. But realistically speaking, I it's I think it's just too much to ask. I think the talent gap is a little too big. And going into Neyland Stadium in Knoxville. They're going to be upset. They're going to be angry. They just lost to a rival in Florida. And, you know, and there was like, they were squaring up with people after the game. It was crazy. I mean, did y'all see that? I was like, golly. So then they're going to take their anger out on us. So, I mean, that's, that's easy to say. Um, and what, what does, what, what I think is also important to take into account is UTSA isn't you know texas or ohio state they're not competing for a playoff spot or even a new year's six spot at that so the whole notion that oh if we let's say we lose to tennessee and we're one and three in non-conference season's far from over i mean it's our first season in the aac the biggest goal <laughs> excuse me and i think it might even be far-fetched is to try to just win the conference we could have gone zero and four in non-conference play and still compete with tulane for the conference which is still on the table. So, and our buy falls perfectly into this mix, having play UTSA or UT, sorry, and then uh, uh, going into the buy. That gives Frank Harris, Trey Moore, whoever else, JT Clark, these extra two to three weeks of recovery before we start things um, in early October. Uh, UTSA, when they played Texas State a couple weeks ago, uh, when Frank Harris went out and Eddie Lee came in, he looked shaky, especially with that. Uh, Texas State defensive line. I know those Tennessee, you know, defensive ends are going to be all over our offensive line. I talked to a couple of them today. <laughs> Obviously, Makai Hart is out, so that's it's going to be even tougher. I think that's going to be – if we had Frank Harris, I'd be a little confident because, like somebody mentioned, I can't remember who, the dual threat that Frank Harris provides, Aramis brought this up, it, it, that, that can give us an edge. But with Eddie Lee there, not really dual threat. We haven't really seen him leave the pocket. It's just it's just going to be all over the place. Uh, Nick, I want to go to you. Uh, just kind of go around the room before we switch topics. What do you have a score predict, prediction being this Saturday in Knoxville? You know, look, I don't like doing these, but you put me on the spot here, so I have to. Uh, God, I don't want to say 40 points for Tennessee, but very well it could happen. I think they could put 40 on our defense. Texas did last year. Yeah, I, I think I get think like a good forty three points that we scored on us. We're gonna get points on the board. I don't think you know Tennessee's defense is you know impossible to figure out, but I'm gonna say forty three twenty. I'm gonna be a little more um, optimistic on the defensive side of things. I guess I I still think Tennessee's gonna put up a good amount of points. But I think we will score 21. I think it's going to be 35-21 to Tennessee. But I do think we're going to have some resistance, especially in the first half. I think it's going to be pretty close and pretty low scoring in the first half, and then Tennessee will probably pull away a little bit in the second. Mm. I'm saying 50-plus for Tennessee. <laughs> and I say that I think that UTSA will score 10. So probably like, I don't know. Mm, yeah. 50 to 10, probably Tennessee. I just think it's too much. I think the I think the morale in the locker room is not great. I think I th even though nobody's gonna say it, I think that, you know, the team is kind of like just trying to gear up for conference play. Let's just have this game in Tennessee, you know, probably gonna get whooped. You know, we're just trying to manage injuries right now. You know, we don't have a bigger goal outside of winning the conference right now. So 
yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a pretty, pretty, pretty big loss on on Saturday. I'm gonna go fifty to uh, ten. So I'm not gonna go fifty points like Ryland did, but I will. It will be a blowout. I'll say forty five twenty four. Um, and opposite of what Ryland said, I think Tennessee is gonna start off the jump, off rip. They're gonna be you know scoring a bunch of points. They're gonna get out to a big lead. I think in the second half is when UTSA is gonna cut it close. But either way, that with all the factors going against UTSA, and then also with Tennessee having lost last week, it's it's not going to be a cl- close game. I have it forty five twenty four. Well, aside from Rylan, aka Mister Debbie Downer over there, everybody else seems to have the game going pretty much how it went last year against UT. I mean, we score, we score. It was forty one twenty last year. I'm hearing forty five twenty thirty or thirty five twenty one and then forty five twenty four, whatever it is. So within within that region, which I think is pretty respectable, the line is twenty. I have us covering. I mean, I I do think it'll be within twenty. I just think Jeff Trailer's too good a coach, and I think Tennessee's coaching is not that good. I'll be completely honest with that. I mean, we saw it last week. We saw it a couple times last season. Coaching's not that good. We have a good coaching staff. Nick, I see you urgently grabbing the mic. What do you have to say? I just want to say, remind the viewers, this is a Ohio State fan. So, you know. What, is, what does that mean? A little biased over here. Like, they don't got good coaching. Who am I biased towards? You're biased towards. You're, you're just a Tennessee hater. Well, Jeff Trailer Jeff has Traylor coached UTSA coach. to. You know UTSA has the best record over the last years other than Georgia, Michigan, Alabama, and Ohio State. Okay, can I just say, do you what, think. did you know that? Though? In this. <laughs> did you know that? I'm passing the mic to whoever, whoever. There we go. That's what I like to hear. Ryland, do you have anything to add to that or or no? No, I don't. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Continuing on, I do think UTSA does have enough competent coaching to keep it within 20 points. And, I mean, we're playing the number, you know, 23 team now. That's not that's not crazy to say, to be within 20 points with the good coaching staff. I mean, we have Texas boys all over our roster. I think we keep it within 20. We damn near did last year against UT. And I think that team was better than this Tennessee team this year. I'll stand by that. They had Bajan. They had um, Xavier Worthy, and their receiving core is still there. They still have those five stars on defense. Tennessee does not have any of that. And that's a fact. So moving on, we'll go to the AP College, uh, AP Top 25 poll. Of course, released this past Sunday. And, of course, there's a lot of errors with it. And, of course, can't wait to dive in it with you all. I'll go to Aramis first. Do you have the poll pull up, Aramis? Okay. Looking at the poll, what are your immediate thoughts or reactions to it? I think the biggest one is Florida State at number four. They barely beat Boston College by two points, 31-29. It was just a lackadaisical performance. Uh, They were definitely going to go down next week because they're playing Clemson. But either way, they shouldn't be this high. It wasn't that good of a win against a team that isn't even ranked. So that's the first one. Um, Looking right here. Uh, Utah, I don't think they should be. Um, I don't think they should be like that high. Alabama going down three spots, I think that's good because they had a close game against South Florida. Um, Oklahoma, I think should be higher. Dylan Gabriel, one of the best quarterbacks in college football, had five passing touchdowns against Tulsa, and Colorado at nineteen. I'm not saying they shouldn't be in the top twenty-five, but having that close of a game against Colorado State. I was telling these guys before the podcast, uh, Braden Fowler Nicolosi, he looked like a first-round pick. Threw for 367 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, the Colorado defense, it's not that good. They got torched by Nicolosi, Horton, Holker. Uh, and again, I'm not saying they shouldn't be top 25, but only going down one spot, yeah, I don't know. And I'm scared for what Oregon and uh, Bo Nix is going to do to them on Saturday. Yeah, I, I see a ton of mistakes on here, honestly. First of all, I don't think Florida State should be number four either. I think USC should probably be in there or Ohio State, one of the two. But right now, probably USC. That could change if Ohio State does beat Notre Dame. They'll definitely be in the top four. Um, Alabama shouldn't even be top 15 for me. I don't think they look – I mean, they're struggling against South Florida. South Florida. They are supposed to be pretty bad in the AAC from what I've seen. So that's pretty that's pretty generous. I mean, they dropped the response, but it's pretty generous to be in the top 15 for me. Um, Oklahoma, I think, should be higher. I think, like you said, Dylan Gabriel's got to be one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. He looks solid. Um, 
Colorado at 19, I would preferably not have them in the top 20. They definitely should be ranked, but I think that Colorado State game has maybe had some questions about their defense a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, you know, it's a positive. It's good to see Florida back in there after a good win against Tennessee. I, you know, it's nice to see them. And Tennessee, though, 12 spots drop. That is that's rough. That's like Clemson going from 9 to 25 after the, after week one. That was pretty bad. Um, but yeah, other than that, I mean, looks all right. Um, I actually don't have a problem with Florida State at four. You know, I'm sure, you know, it wasn't encouraging what we saw, you know, on Saturday. But I'm sure But for right now, I'm okay with them at four. I'm sure, you know, the winner of Ohio State and Notre Dame will jump them. And the other thing that I also do have a problem with is Colorado at 19. I don't think they should have dropped. I It was an emotional night. You know, you got the Colorado State head coach, you know, talking trash about Dion's mom. You know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a Pac-12 at night game. You got takeoff in the stands. You know, you're at the Boulder. Um, you got Lil Wayne before the game. It, it's like the atmosphere was crazy. It was an emotional rivalry game. So the fact that it was close, you know, it doesn't really move me that much. You know, it's those games are going to happen. I think they should have stayed you know, where they're at. But other than that, you know, I'm cool with what else, what all I see there. So. I mean, I just got to say, you know, Florida State, that was a close one by Boston College. I mean, Boston College, they played, they were so close. I, I, I honestly, I wish they won. But, you know, I like seeing Giants fall. Um, I don't think it's too bad. Florida State dropped one spot. I don't, I mean, Letting Texas jump up to three. I don't know. They were kind of slow with that start against Wyoming this past Saturday. I mean, they did win the game, but they were just a little slow. So, I mean, um, going down. Um, I'm excited for the Ohio State Notre Dame game. That should be probably one of the best in the year. Uh, I think that has playoff implications. You know, either of those teams could, could make the college football playoff. But we'll see. This will be a game to go back, you know. When uh, um, when that when the voting starts, um, you know Oregon at ten, Utah at eleven. I mean, that's fair. I mean, I think Oregon's playing good football. I mean, I'm excited for the uh, Oregon Colorado game. We'll see if you know what we'll see what Colorado's made of. You know, Oregon's a good team. Uh, Alabama though, I'm I'm so glad we got I finally got to Alabama. I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure South Florida went one and eleven last year. They did one and eleven. They did. Uh, it was a rain game. I get that, but ooh, Alabama. Yeah, no, it was rough. No excuse. I would. Say, uh, it's kind of hard to nitpick the the list, especially after week three. I mean, you know, college football doesn't really start until November. I mean, the, all these teams are playing out of conference games. It's you know, it's really hard to tell. You know, we are getting into – once we get into October, it'll be a little more interesting. But I have a more uh, – standing, I don't know, a 1,000 feet away, I feel like I have a more broader view. I mean, first off, first thing, the top five, can anyone – does anyone, you know, realize that we literally have one team from each conference in the top five? How amazing is that? You go Georgia from the SEC, you go Michigan from the Big Ten, you go Texas from the Big 12, you go Florida State from the ACC, you go USC Pac-12. That is amazing. That is amazing for the sport. That's my first thought. Second thought, after looking at the top 25, does anyone here know how many of these 25 teams have a loss already? I'll answer, it's four. And do you know what four they are? It's LSU, it's Alabama, it's Tennessee, and it's Florida. What do all four of those teams have in common? They reside in the Southeastern Conference, aka the most overrated conference in college football. Yes, they earned it from... 2005 to 2000, we'll go 17, 18. And yeah, George is dominating. LSU had their dominant run in 2019. But these last two years, you've kind of seen the overall competition drop off, especially this year. You know, I think four, five, six different SEC teams lost in the first two weeks. Alabama does not look the same. Still early to write them off because, you know, if they run the table, they can easily finish as a top two seed. But, I, I, yeah, that's what I want to point out. Great for the sport. We have five different teams from different conferences ranked in the top five. Do want to call out that SEC bias -y. What? The four teams with one loss are all from the SEC? That's absolutely ridiculous. But I do want to lead into 
Florida State being at four, which seemed like a few of y'all had a problem with. I don't really, just because, like I said, it's too early to tell. I mean, yeah, they don't re- look too good, but who does? I mean, who who really does look that good? But I will say this. This weekend does have a lot of playoff implications. Starting at Florida State, they play at Clemson. Great game. Then you go Colorado at number 10, Oregon. Great game. Number 15, Ole Miss at number 13, Bama. Great game. Number 22, UCLA at number 11, Utah. Come on now. Keep this coming. Number 14, Oregon State at number 21, Washington State. Then 21, Iowa at number 7, Penn State. Watch out for Penn State. They are the scariest team on Ohio State's schedule, if you ask me. We'll get into that later in the season. And then, of course, Ohio State at Notre Dame. Uh, That's a lot of big-time matchups. Nick, you have the mic in your hand, so I'll ask you first. Of those five or six marquee matchups this weekend, which one do you think is the most important for the playoff standings at the end of the year? Oh, I just I had to say um, Ohio State and Notre Dame. Both squads look good. I mean, they've you know they've shown you know these first couple weeks of of, of play that they're real, and this could it could be any of their years. I, I truly believe that. Um, you know, it's just also dealing with the rankings right now. I mean, you know, these these are just you know voted by writers, but um, no, it's got to be Ohio State, Notre Dame. Um, I'm a little worried for Ohio State, though. I think Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame can kind of sneak up on them, but you know, we'll see on Sunday. I think it'll be a close game. I don't think it's going to be a blowout, and if it is, I'll be pissed because it's not good. It's not good for the sport. Um, like Nick said, the Ohio State and Notre Dame game, that's probably, for playoff implications, that's probably the biggest one. Um, I'm going to side with the the Ohio State fan here. I think that Ohio State is going to win, and I don't know, is it going to be close or not? I think they're going to win by, like, 14, so I don't think it's going to be, like, super close of a game. But another game that I'm excited for, uh, obviously Colorado and Oregon, um, I don't think that's going to have, like, any playoff implications, but... We're going to see how good Colorado is. We're going to see, you know, if their defense can stand up to Bo Nix. And another one that I'm kind of excited for, I'm a small Michigan fan. They're facing Rutgers. I think Rutgers isn't rank, ranked right now, but they're an underrated team. I think it could give, uh, they could give them some problems. So Rutgers, bro? <laughs> Rut- <laughs> You're excited about Michigan and Rutgers? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to call we'll you. Give out. this man a mic. <laughs> Get him out of here. No, but it has to be Ohio State Notre Dame. Like that is, it's it's just an old fashioned college football robbery right there. I'm, I'm excited for it. Um, I think it's going to be extremely close. I think it's going to be three points or seven points, honestly, separating. I think Ohio State is going to pull it out going into South Bend. Uh, it's in Notre Dame, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is going to be just a classic just college football. I can't wait. You know, I'm excited for it. Uh, honorable mention, though, for me, I would say Oregon and Colorado. I think if Colorado does win and they have a big performance, I think they could maybe make a, a New Year's Six Bowl. They should, you know, make a bid for it. Um, maybe for the playoffs, but I, I don't see it this year. But that's going to be a great test for them uh, going into in Eugene and seeing if they could stop Bo Nix and the, and the mighty rubber ducks. Yeah, it will. It's, it's, it's uh, Notre Dame, Ohio State. You know, as, if we're talking strictly playoffs, you know, it's, it's that. You know, anytime you're dealing with Ohio State, Notre Dame, the playoffs are always going to be involved and the implications are always going to be there. And uh, so that's that. But I am most excited for Colorado and Oregon because I do think that Colorado will win. Uh, I'm not a Bo Nix believer. I am a Shadur Sanders believer. I'm a Deion Sanders believer. You know, no Travis Hunter. But I think they can still get it done. Bro said Michigan and Rutgers. Like, <laughs> bro, what? <laughs> Ain't nobody want to watch that game, bro. For being yeah. real. Bro. I don't think Michigan fans want to watch it. <laughs> I don't think they yeah. Rutgers, But yes, playoff, Ohio State, Notre Dame. But most exciting matchup of the week will be Colorado against Oregon. And I do think Colorado will pull that one out. Well, with the Oregon Colorado game, I really, with Travis Hunter not playing, I really just don't think Colorado will be that competitive. I think this is the game they do get exposed. And not that it'll be a necessarily bad thing. I think it, I think they're due. I think they've skimmed by three weeks. 
They, they won by three points in week one. They struggled against Nebraska early, and that team's pretty bad. And then last week we know what happened. Emotional game, but I just think, I mean, they're playing against a veteran quarterback now. They're playing against our fellow coordinator, Will Stein. I think he's going to dial up some numbers against that defense. Going to Ohio State Notre Dame, obviously, my most excited game of the weekend. I am a fan. But I won't say that has the most implications because both teams have a tough schedule. If you go to, so let's just say Ohio State loses. Well, now if they lose one more game, they're done. And they play at Wisconsin. They pull, are home against Penn State and they're at Michigan. So if you lose, you know, if you lose against Notre Dame, one of those and you're done. Notre Dame, they play Ohio State and they go to Duke. That's a sneaky, tough game now, having beat Clemson. They're at Clemson later in the year. They pull, they're home against USC in three weeks. So, again, it's just too tough of games that it, you know, obviously Ohio State or Notre Dame is going to lose, and they're probably going to lose a second time, just how hard their schedules are. Then I go to that Alabama and Ole Miss game, and I got to tell you, that game excites me for a plethora of reasons. First, with Alabama, I – I do believe they've fallen off, but I think this game will be the deciding factor. Uh, first off, Nick Saban is playing against Lane Kiffin, who I know he does not want to lose to. Lane Kiffin, of all people, he already lost to one assistant this year. He does not want to lose to another, and especially that one, who all he does is take shots at Alabama and post memes on Twitter. I know Nick Saban does not want to lose to them. And we've seen Ole Miss beat Alabama before. I can't remember if it was 2014 or 15. One of those years, you know, when Alabama would lose one game and it was either to Mississippi State or Ole Miss for like a three-year stretch. Yeah, I, they don't want to go back to that. They don't want to lose two games before October. Um, so that game really excites me, especially because Alabama is 13th, if I believe, and Ole Miss is 15. I could be wrong, but they're about in that area. Uh, so, and whoever wins that game will jump to the top eight. We already know that. And if they run the table, because they both have pretty easy schedules, they'll go all the way to Atlanta to play George in the SEC Championship. And who knows after that, Rylan, what do you think about that? Well, one thing I want to say about the uh, Ole Miss-Alabama game is Zachary Franklin, former UTSA roadrunner, was upgraded from doubtful to questionable. So he might be seeing his first uh, uh, game action with Ole Miss. So I think, honestly, that could be a big decider of whether or not they pull that one out. Um, what film do you need? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, that he he's a different difference maker like that. So it will be a fun game for sure, and it'll be even better if Zakari Frank can make that and start against Alabama. No, nah, yeah, I agree. I honestly pretty sneaky one. I think everyone, me included, is kind of riding off Alabama a little bit. But if they do win that game, you know, kind of be you know rumblings. Maybe they're not just done yet. You know, they got one loss. They do have an easier schedule. And if they went out, played Georgia in the SEC Championship, who I'm pretty sure we all agree is probably going to be there, who knows? Maybe maybe Bama will get in there again. Yeah, all, all Bama needs to do is show some signs toward the end of the year because you know they're going to, you know, some of the people in the committee are going to want to see them in there. So if they can, they still have a chance to, if they can just get back on track and get stronger throughout the year and have a good finish of the year, <laughs> you never know. They could make the playoffs. I mean, for the for you know talking going back we spoke about you know Luke spoke about the SEC bias you know I wanted to say it just means more um, <laughs> <laughs> um I have to say I no I do agree with Luke Nick Saban he does not want to lose to Lane Kiffin one of his former assistants like he treats Lane Kiffin like the ugly stepchild like he does not like Lane Kiffin at all you know he doesn't like any of his assistants but you know. Uh, why leave? Why leave the nest of Tuscaloosa? But um, I don't know. I think it could go either way. I think um, Ole Miss. They, they played Tulane last week, right? I'm pretty sure they played Tulane. Hold two on. Weeks ago, yeah. Two weeks ago. Well, uh, they were kind of slow. Um, with yeah, it was two weeks ago. You're right. Um, they're kind of slow against that Tulane team, which uh, you know, very curious to me at least. Um, Alabama has to rebound. They lost to Texas. They nearly, you know, they had a bad game against South Florida. I had to give the edge to Alabama for that game. Yeah, I was going to say it's an interesting matchup, especially considering they have the quarterback battle going on right now with Simpson and Milrow. But with them being at home and then last week having the super close game um, against South Florida, I just, I, I don't see any way that they lose this game. It's going to be a close game. It should be a fun game, but. I, I, I don't think that uh, Nick Saban, 
there's no way that he loses this. We'll see. I I wouldn't rule rule it off. That's why it's my most anticipated game, aside from my own, of course, just because I think both of these teams are pretty mid, who have chances to evolve as a playoff contender at the end of the year if they continue to run the table. Before we get out of here, we are pushing 40 minutes, so don't want to go, you know, five minutes further. I do want to touch on the big leagues. Want to uh, talk about some games on Sunday before we get out of here. I'm a sad Bengals fan right now, so I don't have too much to say besides we better win that game on Monday. Um, yes, Aramis, I see you grabbed the mic. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say the Ravens looked unbelievable in that game. Lamar looked un- – I mean, he's just – he's unstoppable when he's hitting the deep ball the way he was in that game. It's just an incredible game from the team. Offensive line looked good. I mean, and that's partly, in fact, that the Bengals' the defensive line didn't look that good. But just a great win. Starting out 2-0, and I feel good as a Ravens fan. Well – there was the biggest Ravens fan in San Antonio on the mic, Aramis. Yes, I went to that game and watched it in person. Very disappointed. However, as right as I am about sports, and I typically am, I, I really didn't pick the Bengals to win. They are such a terrible team from the jump, and that team does not look good. I'll boast about the Buckeyes all day because I'm, I like what I see. I haven't liked anything what I've seen from Cincinnati. Anyways, enough about my team who does play on Monday night, and they better win that game. Rylan, you have the mic briefly before we get out of here to say a couple takes or an opinion, something you're looking forward to this weekend in the NFL. Well, one of the things was that I was thinking for after uh, <clears throat> week one was that I think the Cowboys are the best team in the league right now. And, you know, they win it. They, well, they're at home, but uh, that Jets defense could not contain the Cowboys at all. And the Cowboys defense looked even better. Uh, so they're, they're my pick right now for the NFC Super Bowl. The Eagles also aren't looking too great. I'm not liking what I see from Jalen Hurts. Uh, so I think statistically right now he's one of the worst passers in the league so far. So that'll be something interesting to watch. And how about my Seahawks? You know, after an awful loss at home to the Rams week one, they come out and they beat Detroit in Detroit, who is coming off a win against Kansas City. And the defense got their first turnover, the Trey Brown pick six. Geno Smith, I mean, Geno Smith looked like a god on that field. He was maneuvering the pocket. Has anybody seen Aiden Hutchinson? Because I didn't see him on Sunday. So he was mo- he was moving around, doing great things. So I think the NFC is going to be a lot closer than a lot of people think. I know they were calling the NFC trash. Uh, the, NFC, the AFC, though, is looking a little bit rough right now. So Man, you're more optimistic about the Cowboys than I am. I'm a Cowboys fan, man. Come on. No, but our defense is looking solid, man. I mean, we just – all over the Jets, like we were all over. We just own New York, I guess. That's basically what it is. I mean, I, come on now. No, but I'm very happy with the win on Sunday against the Jets. Now we got to play the Cardinals, and <laughs> I have a Cardinals fan sitting next to me. You ready for that game, huh, buddy? I don't want to talk about it. No? I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to – I almost wrote up a two-page rant. It was so close, but I didn't do it. I threw it in the trash because I'm like, ain't nobody want to hear that on the podcast. By the way, uh, special shout out to my fantasy quarterback, Justin Herbert. You know, I feel bad for him, man. They're not winning games, but oh my Lord, he's giving me some points. I'll tell you that. 55 points this week. Come on, let's go. But uh, yeah, great, great win for the Cowboys. Hopefully they win again against the Cardinals. And one more thing, one more thing. What the Cowboys are going to do to the Cardinals on that field on Sunday, it, it's just gonna, it should be considered a crime because it's going to be one of the worst losses. Josh Dobbs not, might not make it out that game alive. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, there you go, guys. That's a, that's another episode of the Flipping the Bird podcast. Hopefully we'll see our UTSA runners perform and keep it within 20 on Saturday against Tennessee. And hopefully my Bengals can just do something on Monday Night Football. Uh, we'll be back next week to talk about UTSA's game against the Volunteers. Thanks for listening. And we will.